So hello and uh, welcome everyone uh, to our presentation from Cloud and Heat, Challenges and Advantages of a Highly Distributed Cloud that Also Heats Homes. My name is Amir Fegi, uh, responsible for Business Development Cloud at Cloud and Heat, and together with my colleague Stefan Schlott, uh, we are going to deep dive into our concept of a distributed cloud infrastructure. So the outline of our presentation is um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we do and who we are. And then Stefan is going to present the general concept of our geographically distributed cloud infrastructure, um, also describing use cases, challenges, and advantages. And obviously, at the end, we give you some time to, prov to give us some, any questions you have, and we provide the answers. So cloud and heat, what we do? I mean, what's so special about us? Well, our business model unites two markets. On the one hand, the traditional heating market, and on the other hand, also the fast-growing cloud computing market. So in case of classic data centers, they use additional energy to uh, heat, um, to uh, cool their servers. And in our case, we use the waste heat from those cloud servers in order to heat up buildings and provide warm water. So this way, we offer an efficient green tech alternative for both markets, making us the green cloud from Germany. This picture illustrates the typical cost structure of traditional data centers. Um, our uh, servers are set up in individual buildings, and this way, um, no building or rental costs are incurred in our case. Our servers do not need to be cooled, so this way we save costs on energy. And this together, we have a cost advantage of roughly 50% in contrast to traditional data centers. So this also has an impact on the environment and that's why we consider ourselves the green cloud. This is a picture of a multifamily dwelling. So the heater emits hot water and air, and the hot water, the air, and the heat is all stored in a buffer storage. And then the buffer storage is basically used in order to, for heating and also providing warm water. This was basically a brief introduction of who we are and what we do in a nutshell. And now I'm going to hand over to Stefan, who's going to present our geographically distributed cloud infrastructure. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Stefan Schlott. Uh, I'm a team lead uh, IT architecture and integrations at Cloud and Heat. Um, I'm with OpenStack. I'm working with OpenStack since the Cactus release. Um, okay, I will do the more technical part of the presentation. Um, because of uh, our business model, um, the cloud, uh, our cloud consists of many more smaller micro data centers compared to what you would normally get with a bigger public cloud provider like AWS or Rackspace. Um, because the size of the data centers is basically determined by the size of the basements we can place the heaters in or the heaters are the servers. Um, because of different sizes of the deployments and um, different connection characteristics, um, we have many heterogeneous um, data centers. Uh, and right now, they are all deployed all across Germany. Uh, to the right, you see a picture. Um, where the blue bubbles basically mean the internet connections um, and the rest are the data centers. Because we are a fairly small company compared to, um, to HP or IBM or companies like this, um, we have a very small team when it comes to uh, development um, endeavors. So that's why we uh, follow the integrator approach. We tend to use uh, OpenStack software first uh, when we have a problem. Um, as an integrator, we try to pick the best of breed, so pick the best one which is out there. Uh, if there's no open source solution, we also go um, 
go to property uh, solutions. Um, the whole thing about the integrated approach is uh, that we are almost always trying to fix issues, uh, our issues, uh, but we are probably not the first one having this issue. So there's probably already something out there uh, which we can use um, like it is, or we just have to make minor adjustments. Um, these minor adjustments then we normally call the glue. So we, we pick the best of read out there and uh, just add uh, uh, bits and bolts to make it work for us. Uh, as I said in the beginning, this whole approach is um, it's not really by choice, it's, it's actually a necessity if you only have a small team. So you can't really start uh, from a green field often uh, and you don't have that many developers to build something big on you. And it's also not a good uh, way to do it actually. Um, here's an excerpt of the open source tools we use at uh, Cloud and Heat. Um, when we choose open source uh, tools, we uh, tend to focus uh, on the fact that the tools are fault tolerant so that they um, give us less pain when it comes to operations later on. Uh, and they normally should also have features uh, like scale out, uh, scalability because we have so many small data centers uh, and so we can easily switch between a local area network, local data center and a distributed scenario. Um, Okay, there's a list of uh, tools we use. Uh, the tool we probably use the most is uh, HAProxy. We not only use it for uh, load balancing, uh, we also use it for um, even for some security features or some, some little bug fixing. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite versatile uh, for such use cases. Um, internally for the databases, uh, for the central database, um, or for all databases uh, in OpenStack, like, like the central database. Uh, we try to use solutions which have at least three replicas, um, so that if something goes wrong, um, it's easier and quicker to uh, come back from it. Uh, so we use MariaDB Galera cluster for the normal SQL backend database. We use MongoDB with Silometer. Uh, we also use quite a lot of um, web servers, Apache, Engine, Nginx, and WSGI not only for the OpenStack RP endpoints, uh, but also for our internal uh, services we provide. Our internal services we normally uh, provide or program with uh, using the Python Flask micro framework. Uh, yeah, that's on the next slide. So here's more details on how we uh, develop our glue, so how we provide our glue. Um, we tend to use the microservice approach uh, I know it's a buzzword, but uh, it's actually a good description of what we do. Uh, we try to um, do as less as possible when we provide a clue. Um, the whole thing is a service-oriented architecture, uh, like OpenStack itself. We try to keep our services, our middlewares, as small as possible. The uh, services should be loosely coupled, means that uh, a service only does, does a certain thing and that does it good at this point. Um, we use the Python Flask framework for it and normally our services or internal services uh, provide an easily consu uh, consumable uh, HTTP REST API. So by design, these services are already designed for later distribution. So if they're initially run in the local uh, deployment, uh, because of the design choices um, with the REST API and so on, um, they are already designed for later distribution. So if you want to distribute them across uh, more than just a local deployment. Uh, this whole approach, uh, also with this Python Flask framework, uh, which provides you um, a lot of flexibility uh, in a way that you're not like, for example, Django, uh, which is also a web framework. Um, with Django, you get a lot of batteries attached already. So you have a certain amount of choices already made for you, what, what of kind of backend you got to be using, uh, and things like this. With Flask, you only get a, a very small core, and you can choose uh, from, from backends, for example. You could use Mongo, MongoDB instead of an SQL-based uh, backend, uh, and things like this. It makes it very slim and very flexible for our use cases. The whole uh, approach with using the microservices and Flask 
is also good uh, not only for internal use cases but also for uh, integrating with external partners. Um, last but not least, if you, if you uh, use this microservice approach, uh, you will have data probably, uh, but when you have data, then you should take care of it in storing it in a folder and distributed data store. Uh, like for example, MongoDB or Galera cluster for, for more data, or if it's uh, very important state data, limited uh, size of data, then you could use Zookeeper or etcd or something like this. Okay, some, some more details on the monitoring we use. Um, at CloudNet, we use the open monitoring distribution, specifically uh, mostly CheckMK from this one. Uh, the system is uh, based on or compatible with Nagios, so you can use a lot of uh, the Nagios checks already out there, so you don't have to write new checks if there's already something out there for, uh, for example, RabbitMQ check or something. Uh, there's no need to rewrite these checks, you can just use them. And the open monitoring distribution is, is a distribution which also provides some other nice monitoring tools like NACVIS or PNP for Nagios for visualization, for example. Um, one of the most important reasons we use uh, CheckMK and the whole CheckMK system, which is, by the way, also used by uh, bigger German companies like, for example, the airport in Munich, um, is that it's already designed for distributed monitoring. Um, um, in the picture, you see the top layer, that's a centralized monitoring server, and the lower layers um, are the uh, are free deployments. Every deployment itself has a, has a monitoring dashboard and monitoring infrastructure. Um, from every deployment to the centralized monitoring, there's an encrypted channel, and via this channel, um, you can get the Nagios state data on demand if you want to. You can even go to the centralized monitoring and, um, and use the centralized dashboard, and controlling all of the other deployments dashboards and get, uh, for example, pictures of the state or of the, of the um, there are pictures of the state on demand via HTTP, via this encrypted channel. That's one reason why we choose it, and the other reason is to call the CheckMK uh, BI module. Uh, stands for Business Intelligence. Uh, this module helps you to um, aggregate a service check out of multiple smaller sub-checks. For example, if you have a complete LAMP stack with a lot of instances, you don't um, you don't actually care about the single states of the load balancer and, and some of your uh, web servers or the database. You only care about are still enough machines running for the whole system to be okay. Uh, and you can do things like this so that, you, uh, that the operator only sees one value. That's the important value. Um, if you see this value is broken, then of course you drill down and see uh, what is actually broken and fix it. Okay, for authentication, um, we use Keystone, normal Keystone with the LDAP identity backend. Um, in every deployment, there are multiple Keystone uh, servers running with an LDAP backend. Uh, they are load balanced in the deployment. Um, we use open LDAP distributed um, across our deployments. In the actual deployments, you only have read-only copies of the LDAP. So you can't really change uh, usernames and passwords and things like this in there. Um, for the actual management, we have a centralized Keystone Open LDAP master. Um, there we have the user management where admins can use um, disabled users and things like this. Uh, it's attached to our self-service portal, um, the web console, and the registration process. What we want to do in the future is um, we want to add a more advanced, more fine-grained user management. Um, so. For example, you could provide temporary test accounts in uh, certain smaller deployments um, where you don't have to provide a credit card or something, like, like a temporary test account, so that it's easier for customers to get a feel of our cloud uh, without having the, to provide too much credentials. Um, and we definitely want to add the support for later, later in this year. So we're one of the 30 uh, cloud providers who want to provide the Keystone Federated Identity Backend, um, which was mentioned in the keynotes on Monday. Um, yeah. Okay, some more details on uh, how we do metering. Uh, metering, which leads to, to the builds, of course, in the end. Um, 
the metering is, is uh, normally ba is, is just based on deployment local pseudometer instances. So they, like a normal pseudometer, basically just record and, and take the samples of, of the resource usage in this deployment. Um, what we do is we do a aggregation, hierarchical aggregation based on a location, which would be deployments and the time frames. Time frames would be hourly for uh, deployment utilization, daily for usage and billing projections, and monthly in the end for, for the builds, the monthly builds. Um, when we do this, we do uh, we wrote a little middleware, which basically uses the Cedometer RP to extract the information. There's an asynchronous uh, aggregation of the data. Um, then it's the middle state of the data, an aggregated state of the data, which can be replayed uh, into the central database, where it then goes up to our CRM system and, and the building infrastructure. Um, and it has to be asynchronous because Cedometer can take quite a long time if you have a lot, a lot, a lot of data in, in the MongoDB. Um, and because it's asynchronous, you also have this possibility with the replay. Um, this intermediate uh, data we aggregate from, from the Cedometer instances, we store in multiple geographically distributed Swift deployments, also for further fault tolerance. Um, yeah. We use Cedometer not only for um, our building purposes, but we use the meters also for uh, in connection with ANOVA uh, to get an overview of what, how our deployments are utilized. Um, so basically, the checks is nothing else but a static configuration file of how many resources you could actually use in this deployment, the maximum resources, and comparing the current state. The checks are divided into static and dynamic checks. So the static checks would always say, okay, we have always 100 instances, which I'm capable of uh, launching there in this deployment. The dynamic check uh, would take into account the data from NOVA. For example, if, if the host is down for some reason and can't be used for scheduling. Might be maintenance, might be a temporary error or something. Um, and this whole check is outputted as a, as a normal NAGIOS check, a normal NAGIOS check line and check and K check, uh, which then, of course, we can use with the, with the centralized monitoring I showed a few slides ago, uh, and aggregate the overall state uh, of how our deployments are utilized or not. OK. Um, now I'm moving more or less to, to uh, from the internal view, Cloud and Heat, to, uh, to the customer view, um, where we'll show advantages and also challenges. Um, so that would be one advantage, um, to get a higher fault tolerance uh, of your application if you run it on our cloud and a distributed deployment. Uh, it can help you to uh, basically avoid problems with which you would have with one of the local deployments, like power outages, some kind of failures, performance degradation. Um, in order to do this, uh, your application needs, of course, to be, uh, needs to be cloud aware. So there need to be some, uh, the application needs to have some knowledge about that it's actually distributed, that's actually a deployment which is not the same as, uh, as the other instance it's running in. Um, that's at least very helpful if you, if you design your own application from scratch. Uh, an example, a um, popular example for this uh, kind of application which would make use of this is a photo and website or web application. You could think of a website which, if it needs a state, has a shared state across a wide area replicated MongoDB or Galera cluster, for example. Uh, that's the state shared. Um, the rest, the actual uh, website rendering and stuff is uh, stateless and you can distribute it across uh, multiple deployments. Uh, and in the front, uh, you would have something like round robin DNS or like a failover system at the DNS level. So if one deployment goes down, um, then you actually have not, the, the website is still online, so it don't, don't take it down. Um, we are well aware that um, if you have, uh, companies producing websites or building things like this, uh, they are not necessarily the companies who also take care of uh, distributing their infrastructure themselves across different deployments. Um, so for that reason, we also provide um, a product called App Elevator, which is basically a platform as a service, service 
which we aut automatically deploy across different deploy distributed deployments in our use case. Uh, we are partnering with Cloud Control from Berlin, uh, who provide a white labeling uh, platform as a service, which you might have heard of, of them because they are the guys who bought the dot cloud business from Docker and currently running the dot cloud business. Um, so we are basically combining uh, the knowledge and the proven ease of use uh, from the platform as a service from a provider who knows what he's doing on this level. We're providing the infrastructure as a service uh, level. Um, we uh, connect the deployments with a virtual private network, so two or three uh, distributed EIS deployments, uh, and on top, platform as a service is running. Um, cloud control, our partner takes care of uh, maintaining the platform as a service, so service updates. Uh, and so on and so forth. They have uh, quite a good level of uh, automation, so if there's a new bug out there, it's usually fixed within a day. Um, also good is that they, they are compatible to the Heroku build pack, so they're compatible to Heroku platform as a service, and they enforce the user to, um, to use a stateless model. So um, when a user designs a website or provides a website, it has to be uh, stateless in a way that uh, he has to use one of the add-ons like MySQL or MongoDB to actually use the state. The application itself is stateless. So they, they say they can always just kill the application and rerun it in another, another container host. Uh, and when a user uses MySQL or MongoDB, uh, he doesn't have to take care of uh, the replication because in the end, uh, he just uh, attaches to an endpoint and um, the actual data is already replicated. So they use, uh, they pro uh, the platform as a service provider or we provide already a uh, replicated MongoDB or replicated MariaDB cluster. Um, so the one who designs the website only has to take care that it looks nice and uh, that he can push his stuff in the, in the Git repository. Um, and it's also enforced the model like um, development, staging, production, things like this. There are some links down there. Um, okay, now I'm, now I'm coming to one of our uh, biggest challenges, actually. Um, I said it right in the beginning, we normally have much smaller deployments, or not that much anymore, but smaller deployments than uh, what you would get in a normal cloud provider, like AWS or Rackspace, because they have huge, huge buildings where they have a lot of servers. And we are basically limited by the space we get in the basement. The basements are getting bigger, so the small, uh, data sets are not that small. Uh, so for most customers who only want to spin up, uh, spin up a few instances, it's not a big issue. Uh, at, point of uh, at the time of registration, we kind of do a static uh, load balancing. So a few customers go there and a few customers go there. In the deployment, uh, they all have the same feature set. So they don't necessarily see where they are uh, or what they're doing with it. For bigger customers, we kind of give them awareness uh, which are deployments they can work with, or even if they ask us. Um, if you have a bigger customer, like for example, who wants to uh, send up a huge batch cluster, a lot of instances, then of course it's an issue because all our deployments uh, are separate regions. So they all have a set of an own keystone catalog, all the, all the separate endpoints. Um, Apart from the authentication data, the LDAP in the backend, there's uh, nothing shared. Um, so if you want to spend a lot of, uh, spin up a lot of instances, uh, that's less resources addressable via a single RPN endpoint. Um, but there's also solutions to that. Um, just as an example, the batch cluster, there are uh, systems which kind of build for this as well. So you can deploy a batch cluster uh, uh, across different deployments in, in hierarchy, for example, so that you would have um, the batch masters talking to each other. Uh, that's because the whole batch systems and the scientific computing part um, comes from a global community where they would have data centers all across the world. So it's, uh, the data centers are bigger, of course, but uh, it's quite similar to what we provide in, in terms of the distributed data centers. Um, or if you would have, uh, would have, would be the normal web application developer, you could use tools like we provide the app elevator. Another issue might be that uh, you wanted to have instances in different deployments and wanted to have them uh, layer to local connectivity. 
Um, there we can provide VPNs linking deployments. So you can actually use the local IP of the other uh, instance in the other deployment and it looks like um, a local access. That's of course not good if you have a lot of data you want to push through. But for such use cases, you will probably uh, use uh, distributed data set like MongoDB or Galera across the deployments. Or you would, some, would use some public API endpoints to interchange data. For example, a Swift endpoint uh, or a distributed message queue or something like this. Okay, that's another challenge uh, or question which often comes up with customers. Uh, they, if they want to integrate a bigger workload with us, uh, it's data distribution. So data distribution is, uh, is like, for example, if you want to have input data for a batch shop, or output data for a batch shop, or if you want to distribute images uh, you have prepared yourself. Um, when this question comes up, um, I often ask if it's, if it's really necessary. So the customer should have a look or he should have a look. Uh, and assess or even reassess your workload or your architecture of the whole system. If it's really necessary that you need to distribute one and the same data across all deployments. Because quite often the workload you might have uh, is capable of parallelization. Uh, you could run different workers in different deployments. You could shard your data according to where the workers are running. And if you need to transfer data, it might be possible to uh, have a look at the data and minimize the data before you need to transfer it. So you could just aggregate uh, what you really need and let the rest, uh, the amount of data stay in the deployment where it was computed. Like for example, what we do for the metering. So we only transfer what we really need up to the central uh, metering server or billing server. Also one other thing, uh, um, if it's possible, you do not want to distribute images or instances for that matter. What you actually want to have distributed is the data you work on. Um, the images or the instances are normally only the, uh, the framework, uh, like, uh, like there's an Apache running or something like this. Um, and for things like this, so that you always have the same environment uh, running, uh, you would normally uh, use a limited image catalog saying, uh, okay, in every deployment you have the same Ubuntu version, cloud, uh, cloud image or CentOS or something like this but very limited, and then you would take, uh, use automation tools like Cloud Init and then Shuff and Puppet uh, to stand up your environment. So you have an environment, uh, and then the only thing you have to distribute is actually uh, the data you want to work on. Um, the data you want to work on is then normally uh, stored in a distributed data store, like I already talked about MongoDB a couple of times, or Galera, um, which are, Per definition, at least MongoDB is already perfectly designed for wide area networks. Yeah, and the last sentence, um, more or less already told you, um, so that you really have to take care of what you really need to transfer and think about it, uh, or think about it twice. Okay, um, that's an advantage which you could get. Of course, you need some application that could work with it. Uh, you could parallelize your workloads across different deployments. Uh, you could get a much lower latency possible uh, compared to the bigger cloud providers, even if, they, uh, if they're sitting next to the um, big internet connection points, because we sometimes have um, deployments which are connected to a local service provider ring, and if the actual customer is, is closer to the service provider ring, then the latency is lower. Um, you could make it up to the extreme that it's a private cloud or a hybrid cloud approach that uh, you basically have your uh, servers running in your own building. Then of course the latency is like a local area network, right? What we can provide, we can uh, provide a mixture of uh, private cloud and a public cloud. Uh, this is an example where you would have centralized building across the deployments. So in the top there's a centralized building uh, server, like for a normal public cloud. Um, then you're in the next layer there's uh, different deployments. To so the left there's a separate deployment, a separated deployment for a specific customer. Uh, we can do this because our uh, uh, deployments are usually smaller or it's actually a, a deployment which is running in the same building as the customer. Uh, and to the right are normal deployments. The normal deployments are attached to, uh, to our standard uh, um, authentication data backend. Um, and the separated deployment would be connected to the own 
I don't know, Active Directory or LDAF database, which could also be merged with the external, uh, the public cloud database. Um, if you want to have a mixed setup, like for example, if external uh, people working for you, then you can u mix it with the public cloud database, or you could totally separate authentication um, with your own database. But in the end, uh, with this hybrid approach, you could get your builds uh, from normal deployments and you separate it one all in one bill at the end of the month. Okay, because of the smaller deployments, uh, we actually also have a much higher flexibility. Uh, we can change out, also because of OpenStack, can change out uh, the software backends, for example, for SIM or, or for block storage or for some of the other systems, uh, we can switch out the hardware. Uh, so we can tailor the whole deployment hard and software much more to the workload, um, which a customer might run on. Um, and we can tailor performance versus cost effectiveness. So if it's a workload uh, where it makes no sense to use SSDs, uh, then we go for S uh, HEDs or something. Okay, and here's a slide uh, on the Outlook. Um, with focus on the, federal, uh, on the um, distributed environments, of course. Uh, we definitely want to use the um, multi-region SWIFT or geographically distributed SWIFT across wide area network. Um, we also want to look if we can use it as a glance backend so that's an easier to uh, keep the image catalog up to, up to date. Um, we tried this uh, multi-region SWIFT briefly in a lab uh, about a year ago or so, I think. Uh, we didn't proceed with it because we have a small team and many other things to do and wasn't so pressing at the time. Uh, what we definitely want to add is the Keystone Federated Identity um, backend. We had a lot of customers already asking us uh, why, should we, should, why should I again always provide the same username and password, right? So it's much simpler for the, for the customer if you can use a more limited set of RP endpoints or dashboards. We're also looking into containers uh, and container orchestration um, for our internal use cases, but also for, uh, for cloud and heat products, for example. So that uh, a customer could, could, write, um, could write their software and uh, the dev environment uh, is easily pushable without too much adjustment to our cloud and runs in the cloud and works. Um, one other thing, which is very interesting for us is orchestration, which again makes it easier for us and also for the customer to handle this amount of uh, resources. Um, and of course, not only simple single deployment orchestration, but also cross deployment orchestration. Okay, that was the last slide. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, would like to answer them. And there are some email addresses of us as well. So I was just wondering there, um, my boss actually saw something else you did a couple of months ago and pointed this out and said I had to come and wonder about you guys. What do you do in summer? <laughs> uh, it really depends on the deployment. So we have deployments. Uh, so there's always a fail safe of uh, just getting the stuff out, right? But that would mean that your, your no, no, servers... No, I'm, I'm no, saying, I'm saying it depends on deployment. In the end, if all, all things break, uh, then uh, the server don't get overheated, we can blow it out. Uh, but normally we have uh, deployments where it could be just a baseline we, we provide. So even summer is not a problem. So we have uh, buildings where we work together with local utilities. So we only provide 10 or 20% of the baseline. So it's not really a problem in summer because they can regulate the 80% the thing. Uh, that, that is a possibility. Uh, we also in talks to people like have a pool or something so that you have the back cooling already uh, much better in place. But it's definitely an issue, but it's, it's not an issue which really affects uh, the servers in the end. Do you think, um, what would it take to do deploy this elsewhere in the world where large scale networking is a much larger problem? Here in North America, for example, there is crappy internet to everybody. Uh, yeah. I guess it's. Uh, I guess it's more a problem of the, of the 
power supply and things like this and, and other problems than the internet connection. Um, right now we are just in Germany. Uh, we are thinking about expanding, but then I guess we will start uh, expanding Europe, where it's more close to the infrastructure level, is more close to what we get in Germany. Yeah. yeah, the only place here I think it would probably work out is large apartment buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what we do. So we started with, uh, with single single houses. We actually started with a proof of concept with uh, the house of uh, one of the founders, um, which is a very in a energy efficient house. So. Uh, then, then we move to bigger apartment buildings. We actually have bigger apartment buildings, uh, freshly built, where we have a, um, with proud uh, heaters in the basement. Yes, that's that's the perfect thing for us. Yes, and then no office buildings or things like this. Yeah. And then nobody complains about how loud the servers are in their basement. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, intriguing concept. I like it. Um, okay. A nice presentation, by the way. Um, one question: How many sites? How many data centers? Micro data centers. Do you currently have? Um, it's forty to fifty, I think, uh, but the size uh, largely varies. So we have four or five of the bigger data centers, uh, and many of the smaller data centers we use for, for testing or separate customers, like uh, like I explained. Um, and it's expanding. So actually, the requests for building new data centers uh, is quite high. So we are at, at a level where we have to say, oh, no, right now we're not building any new data centers, we have to wait for the other things to catch up. Is it mainly private persons that approach you, or is it mostly organizations? It started with uh, private persons, yeah, like smaller buildings, um, but we are moving to, to bigger buildings like uh, apartment complexes and things like this, yes. That's, that's more like we want to do it because, yes, we can handle smaller deployments, but it's also for us better to have a bigger deployment, right? Uh, so apartment buildings or bigger office buildings is, is what we prefer right now. Yeah. It's also more focused for us with a small team. Okay, one final one. Um, one of the things that when I look at OpenStack, see is that OpenStack does not have a lot of infrastructure in place to um, understand the heterogeneous nature of, of a cloud. Um, what are the, the main limitations that, that you have seen in that respect? Um, it could be better, definitely, yeah. It could be like tagging or something to, to describe uh, deployment much much more effective and um, use scheduling for this. We actually wrote our own schedulers uh, inside the deployments um, to have some awareness where's the cold part, where's the, where's the hot part, or things like this. Um, but it's actually quite easy, if you, at least in terms of the scheduler. So we didn't have that big issues to providing our glue. It could have been easier, but it's not really because of the, um, the, the lot of RPs you have and you can work with. Uh, you don't necessarily need to fork anything and go down to the code. Uh, it's, it's still at a good level that you can just provide our middlewares and our glue on top. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, just, just a couple of questions. I'm more curious than anything. Uh, the first one is, uh, what do you use for your um, deployment mechanism? Are you using uh, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, or a combination of the above? Um, we're using Chef mostly, yes. Okay, cool. Um, are you using the community cookbooks that Chef has for OpenStack, or you got your own? I think so, yeah. We use the StackForge cookbooks. Okay, yeah. That's, as, that's... As, a base, as, as a basis, yeah. Yeah, that's what I work we on. We have yeah. some, okay. uh, some, some adjustments we have to do. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> we got a ways to go to get those cookbooks right, but we're making progress. Yeah. The second question I had was, you put the cost circle up there, and I was intrigued by it, but I also think to myself a little bit about out loud here. I used to work, um, um, I'm from IBM, I used to work on the Smarter Planet, right, the whole initiative. Okay. Yeah. And my job was energy management. Yeah. Um, and it was more to monitor the energy you're wasting in your data center and mm -hmm. how you can control it. But that's a data center, right? Mots are data centers, right? And if you control a little bit in your data center, you save thousands, a hundred thousands, and millions of dollars. What I'm curious here is that two questions on, on, on your, your physical separation, if you will, of your smaller data centers. Isn't there a cost for the on-site? Somebody has to go there and fix these things when they break. So there's a cost for travel time and, and get a, you're not going to hire the apartment manager to do it. And I'm also curious about, you also then do remote monitoring of mm -hmm. these facilities in terms of not only for the billing, but also for the energy and making sure that things aren't melting? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is the monitoring I talked about um, regarding the maintenance effort. Yes, it is an issue. 
Of course, it's smaller, smaller deployments, but smaller deployments not compared to bigger data centers not, does not necessarily mean that the effort is less right. uh, per data center. It's even the same, and in the end, it's then more, right? Um, but when we build up our deployments, we basically take care of that we have at least three copies of the important things, and a lot of things can break to up to a certain level because uh, until there's really a necessity to move there. Oh, okay, sure. So we yeah. let it break uh, until a certain level, and then when the level is reached, we move there and have to react. Yes, you have to do it. The, you also mentioned the apartment complex solution. And I know yeah. that, that one of the part we're doing with IBM is a, this thing called Smarter Cities. The one thing with the Smarter Cities, well, if you have an apartment building with uh, a thousand people living in it, let's say, um, if you have a server bank within the building, also providing cooling or whatever, or heat, um, the question was, uh, can you cooperatively go after the market of, of the folks in the building? Um, for example, if everybody in the building is using Netflix, and everybody in the building that, is watching yeah, the net. Wouldn't it be nice if they didn't have to go, you know? To, that's to, that's actually one of our ideas. Story. Yeah, that's actually actually one of our ideas. Uh, like when the next football World Cup is coming, exactly. uh, then you're much closer to to the customers. Yes, and the latency is much better. It's like like a CDN, if you if you might think of it. Yes. And how long have you guys been around? Since 2012, officially, we named our Terra initially. Uh, if you have heard this name, um, yeah, since 2012 officially, but we started at the end of 2011. Yeah. So for networking, do you use whatever is currently coming into the building, or do you get special redundant? Um, so, so the networking hardware is, is is not that much different from normal uh, data centers. Uh, we have normal switches. Uh, we use uh, Viata, Viata from Brocade for, uh, for the routers. Uh, so open source software, normal hardware, we combine there, a normal Ethernet. Okay, and then your, your connectivity, your provider, is that? Um, Again, sorry. Do you have like business class? Um, what we use for our data centers, yes, we connect it. Uh, so it's also different from the, from the smaller deployments. They're not necessarily connected to, uh, to the big lines, right? Uh, but our, our bigger data centers, they are connected to the fiber channel and they really provided um, the fiber directly to our data centers. Okay. It's like normal standard data center stuff. Okay. It's not that much different. Okay, any more questions? On screen, at least. Okay, then I think we're done. If you have any more questions, we can ask uh, us offline. Thanks. Thank you.